okay, perhaps we'll go ahead and get started and we can have more folks join us. As you probably saw at the beginning, this workshop is being recorded. Um, so for those that join a little later, you know, they can view that later on. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nasha Lalani. My name is um, my name is Nasha Lalani. I already said that. Um, I'm an associate regional planner at SCAG, and I'm the project manager uh, overseeing this development streamlining project. Um, for CEQA and other related options that we hope to present to you and have been presenting to you over the course uh, of this project. This is the fourth and final workshop in a series. And as I mentioned, you know, we do have these available on our website and I'll speak to where those resources are available in a moment. Going on to the next slide, you'll see that this project is funded through the state. Um, it's through a grant, the Regional Early Action Program. So as part of that, we are pursuing this project and hoping to provide with you a series of guidance materials and resources that you can, you know, use in your respective jurisdictions or in your work if you're joining us from other entities. As I mentioned, and as you'll see on the next slide, we do have a web page for this project where you can access the guidance materials. So if you want to take a look at the link, I think it'll, it's already been posted in the chat, you can go there. We have a series of PDFs that cover a range of development streamlining options, some that are related to CEQA, some that cover different types of legislation. These tools are really helpful, we hope, um, and they have checklists and various examples and further explanations for other topics that you may hear about today. So please do check back there if you have, you know, additional questions or if you want to explore uh, these topics in further detail. And on the next slide here, just telling you before I turn it over to our fabulous consultant team, you know, keep in mind that everything that we share with you in these workshops, the items that we've also posted on our website, they're meant for really general informational purposes. We aren't directly guiding, you know, decision making on behalf of any jurisdictions or entities. We would hope that you use these resources as a way to inform your decisions, maybe to explore certain topics further, but in no way are we giving you any, you know, legal opinion. And with that, I'll turn it over to our uh, consultants to introduce themselves and kick off the workshop. Great. Thank you, Nasha. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Chad Beckstrom. I'm a senior environmental director with Ascent and have been a CEQA practitioner for over 25 years with clients in both the public and private sectors for a wide range of projects, including housing. I've had the privilege of serving as the project manager on behalf of SCAG for these development streamlining efforts over the past year or so, and we've uh, developed the guidance materials and presented these workshops on behalf of SCAG. Uh, happy to have Curtis Alling and Margaret Sahagi as my co-presenters here today. Curtis is a principal and co-founder of Ascent with over 40 years of experience in the industry. He's a recognized expert in complex and often litigious environmental impact and natural resources management programs. Margaret is a managing partner of the Sahagi Law Group and has practiced for the last 30 years with a focus on assisting cities, counties, and other public agencies navigate the legal complexities of land use, CEQA, and NEPA. She's a planner turned lawyer, having worked as um, a city planner prior, prior to practicing law. So she brings a, a unique perspective to the planning and environmental uh, law fields here. A few housekeeping items to cover before we get started. This webinar uh, is being recorded and will be available on SCAG's website, so you can keep an eye out for it there over the next week or two. If you have any questions along the way, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom, and we'll attempt to address as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation here. You can also send any questions directly um, you have to Nasha at the email address here. And um, finally, we'll be hosting some office hours in the future to address uh, some more focused questions. So keep an eye out for those announcements and registration information um, on SCAG's website. So here's our agenda for today. In the, uh, in the last workshop, we provided an overview of CEQA streamlining and really focused on the various exemptions that are available <clears throat> for different types of housing projects. Um, that meet certain criteria. So in the workshop today, we're going to be focusing on streamlining in the context of using prior environmental documents to reduce or eliminate further environmental review under CEQA. Uh, we'll talk about tiering and how to use program EIRs for later activities. Uh, next, we'll go over how to use uh, community plans and general plan EIRs to streamline the CEQA process. And we'll talk about streamlining for infill projects 
And finally, streamlining under SB 375 and SB 743 for transit-oriented projects. And then finally, we should have some time at the end to show you some of the tools and worksheets we've developed, as well as answer some questions you may have. So in the last workshop, we provided an overview of what SQL streamlining is. And just as a refresher, streamlining really involves expediting SQL review through an exemption or reliance on previously adopted environmental documents. Um, as I mentioned, we're focused on the latter in this workshop today. And the purpose of streamlining is really to avoid unnecessary documentation and reduce redundancy. Um, and there are streamlining, uh, tiering and streamlining provisions that have been in the CEQA guidelines and statutes for years, but they're just not well utilized for, for one reason or another. And the legislature has passed various laws over the years to provide CEQA incentives and relief for certain types of projects that are characterized as infill or are closer to transit to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And to re revisit this slide from the prior workshop, I want to point out the second and third steps in this chart. So when there's not an exemption available, we really want to try to take a hard look to see if there are other prior environmental documents that may be used. Now, this may entail program EIRs, specific plan EIRs, general plan EIRs, or even the uh, Regional Transportation Plan Sustainable Communities uh, Strategy Plan from, from SCAG. And when, uh, when a project meets the definition of a transit priority project or other features of an infill project within a transit priority area, there are other ways to reduce the level of documentation and review. So we wanna uh, start out with a poll. Before, um, before we get into some of these, we wanna ask you, what's the biggest constraint to using SQL streamlining tools? Do you fear legal challenge? Is it a lack of knowledge or understanding by staff or decision makers? Do you lack the resources that may be necessary to implement some of these tools? Have you found streamlining does not work for you? Or maybe you're using some of these with overwhelming success. We'll give you about um, another 15 seconds or so. All right, let's show the results there. Okay, so large majority are C, public decision maker expectations that SQL review must be an EIR or MND. So maybe we can try to uh, to help you help them change some of those expectations uh, going forward here. Okay, so Margaret, you want to take it away on talking about Absolutely. tiering? Absolutely. So let's talk about tiering. What What is tiering in? As Chad said, maybe this is something you can present by way of um, conversation or training to your various planning commissioners, boards, and, and councils. Um, tiering is a great streamlining tool. It refers to using the analysis of general matters that are contained in your broader EIR. Um, for example, we'll think of your general plan EIRs or a policy statement EIR. Within your later EIRs or mitigated negative declarations, focusing on more narrow projects. Um, some other examples would be later action under a program, program EIR or under a master EIR, if you use those, um, supplemental or subsequent um, review, infill projects, which we're going to talk about later, you know, based upon a sustainable community strategy, or um, an infill project that's consistent with an SCS or EIR for a specific plan. Um, as noted on this slide, and you'll see citations on other slides, really everything is set forth in guideline section 15152. It's, it's pretty helpful there. Um, next slide. So, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm back one. Uh, so the tiered document, you've got your program EIR, the tiered document would then incorporate by reference the general discussions that are in your, your programmatic document and concentrate your later document on issues that are really specific to that project. Um, I would suggest you really look at Appendix J. Um, I view it as sort of my shopping list when I'm trying to figure out how to tier or how to respond to a client comment that 
gosh, we want an EIR, but we want it done next week, um, then I will look at Appendix J. Um, I did hear, and I don't know if it's folklore, but during the Wilson administration, when they were trying to streamline CEQA, particularly with tiering and the like, there's a story that one page of the legislation was left on the, at that time, Xerox machine. And that important page of the legislation was trying to do away with so many of the different terms you see on Appendix J and consolidate it into something that's perhaps a little more logical for all of us. But unfortunately, that sheet was left behind in the copier. Sounds like folklore to me, but it does express the frustration that we all have that there's too many terms. But look at them as opportunities, what can I say? But definitely go look at Appendix J, um, because using that tiered document can really eliminate repetitive discussions and focus that later document on effects that were not examined as significant effects on the environment in the prior EIR, or perhaps are now susceptible to a substantial reduction, perhaps, or avoidance um, by any specific re revision to the project. So, so take a look. So now let's talk about that program EIR. Um, here again, the legislature has even said that this is a very effective tool to accelerate housing development. And perhaps that's the pitch um, to your lead agency and your decision making is really being advocated for purposes of getting you know, sticks in the ground for housing. Um, certainly we know lead agencies can determine that that later proposed residential project may be already consistent with an approved plan or program that's already been covered. So the program EIR process, as you can see on the citation here, are covered um, in 15168. Um, here again, comprehensive EIR, that can be characterized as one larger project, an affordable housing project, um, we list the definitions here. You may do a program EIR on projects that are related geographically, even if they have different applicants or their logical part and chain of actions, a continuing program, or here again, in individual activities with similar effects and mitigation. Um, I think it's something and it's probably what I consider one of the more common approaches that we see. So once your program EIR is established, I sometimes like to add language to that encourages the tiering and the types of activities that would come up at the, at the next level. I don't want to foreclose other options, but I often suggest to a client that they include a discussion of that. Um, and if the later activity would have effects that were not examined within that program EIR. I always recommend an initial study be prepared to determine whether or not we're going with an EIR or we're going with a negative declaration. And if you determine that no subsequent EIR would be required, then you can approve the activities being within the scope of the project and no new environmental document would be needed other than the programmatic EIR. So that determination, whether your activity falls within the scope is a factual question based upon substantial evidence. So that means doing your work. And, and I think if we go to the next slide, Thank you, Chad and Curtis probably agree with me, preparing some sort of written checklist um, is advised. Take something like the initial study checklist that's in Appendix G, and you revise that to ask the questions of whether or not you need to do any supplemental work. Um, and look at 15162 for whether supplemental review would be required. And remember, you're still going to adopt certain findings in a statement of overriding considerations if you do, in fact, have significant unavoidable impacts. Next slide. So let's turn to that world when you need to do an additional review. And when does that come up? 
you've got an EIR or a negative declaration, you've approved your project, and yet you still have a new discretionary approval that's required. So that puts you into this world of 15162. So you're asking the question here, are we doing a subsequent supplemental or addenda for this, for this document? So the triggers for this um, are basically set forward in 15162 through 15164. I apologize for having to cite all the guideline sections. That's just the way it is when we're dealing with these, right? And what we're talking about here are really summaries of these guideline sections. So be sure to go to the fine print in the guidelines and in CEQA itself, and don't just rely on summary um, PowerPoint slides. But your supplemental or subsequent CEQA um, document be it an EIR, mitigated NEGDEC, or NEGDEC, is required when there are one, substantial changes to the project, or substantial changes to the project's circumstances, or there's new information that could not have been known at the time you certified the EIR. It's available now, and those changes or new information do require major revi revisions to the EIR because there's new significant effects or a substantial increase in the severity of an impact, okay? If none of those things occur, none of that criteria, then you can look to use an addendum. And when I use an addendum, I like to justify why the addendum is appropriate. So that's why I always start with something like a revised initial study. It may conclude that I don't need to do any more work, but then I've got the substantial evidence to support that no more work is um, needed. And I think that is appropriate. So next slide, please. So here we, we know the huge advantage is limiting the scope to the modifications related to those changes. Um, further streamlines. I honestly don't care sometimes whether you call it a supplemental document or a subsequent, but by definition, supplement is for minor changes. Subsequent is for more substantial changes and major revisions. One important thing to point out, though, is it's very interesting. This is the one portion of CEQA where CEQA says, you shall not do more review unless. And what 15162 says is, no subsequent EIR shall be prepared unless the lead agency determines on the basis of substantial evidence in light of the whole record that those criteria that I went one, two, three through exist. Because CEQA has said, you've, the legislature has said, you have done enough work unless you have those triggering events. So keep that in mind when you embark on subsequent supplemental or addenda. Next slide. Okay, so we're gonna do a poll number two. Um, have you used hearing in our program EIRs and did it help to streamline the CEQA process? We wanna know if how many of you have used some of these tools already and whether it was helpful? I'll give you about 15 seconds here. It's a quick one. All right, let's see the answers. Mm, kind of a split there. So some people find it helpful, some have not used tiering. So. Yeah, I'd be interested um, in the, we're using the Q&A box today, right? Yep. I would, I'd be interested in any comments on why it was not helpful. Absolutely. Oh, it's good to know. All right, Curtis, you're up. Okay, Chad, thank you very much. Now we would like to discuss streamlining for projects that are consistent with a general plan, community plan, or zoning action. Um, next slide. This is uh, one of the most powerful 
and uh, most available uh, streamlining tools that a city or county can can use for housing development. It's powerful because it's another one similar to what you said, Margaret, where there's a statement that uh, that uh, mandates avoidance of unnecessary environmental review, and um, uh, and it's available because uh, it it uh, uses as its foundation the general plan community plan or zoning action. And of course, all cities and counties have at least the general plan and uh, and likely an EIR that uh, supports that. So uh, you're in the position to use this tool as long as you have general plan, community plan, zoning action with an EIR uh, certified to support it. So uh, what does the, the guideline say as far as the, um, the directive to not do unnecessary uh, environmental review. It says that projects are consistent with the development density that's established uh, in uh, zoning, community plan, or general plan policies where an EIR was certified shall not require, in other words, uh, you know, another of those shall nots, shall not require additional environmental review except as might be necessary for project specific significant effects that are peculiar to the project or peculiar to its site. Now, you know, these are terms that uh, I don't think I've ever seen the, the word peculiar in law before. Margaret, I don't know, is it, is it anywhere else in law that you're familiar with? <laughs> Not that I am, but we could say the law can be peculiar from time to time. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Well, you know, and it, it, of course, it's always fun to to uh, uh, fall back on Merriam-Webster or another, another uh, credible dictionary. Uh, and look at the definitions because there's really not uh, uh, guidance in the uh, uh, in the guidelines for the definition of peculiar in its general sense. There are some conditions that uh, we'll talk about here about where it's not peculiar, but um, we we like to have fun with the strange or odd uh, definition, you know, <laughs> element of definition. Uh, sometimes I suppose they are strange or odd, but but uh, the one that's probably more more applicable is. Uh, uh, particular uh, or special uh, to the uh, project or its site. And if you look at the word particular and its definition, it's distinctive among other examples. So as you can tell, it's really uh, a condition that's not a general one, but it is uh, particular to the, the project at hand or to the location of that project, the site of that. So it gives you a little bit of, of guidance. But uh, what's also interesting is the concept of consistent and the definition of that, because uh, to be consistent and therefore be eligible for this uh, streamlining, uh, it says that uh, the density must be the same or less than the standard expressed in the um, uh, for the parcel in the general plan, community plan, or zoning action. Um, you know, in, in today's world of, the, of density bonus, I think this might be a little bit archaic. You know, there might there might be one could argue there are cir circumstances where density is uh, is now going to be higher, uh, and uh, perhaps this uh, streamlining tool should be available for that. But as it stands now, density is the same or less than than uh, the standard expressed. But it only speaks to density. There's not an acreage limit. There's not a unit limit. Or anything of that nature. So it's pretty flexible and and uh, and broadly applicable if your project is consistent with the general plan, community plan, or zoning action density requirements. <clears throat> now, another way that uh, uh, projects you know can make use of this uh, the streamlining tool is um, uh, where the the project impacts um, are covered by the EIR uh, and. Uh, there's not any, you know, similar to um, to some of the points that uh, that Margaret was making. There are no uh, significant impacts that uh, that weren't required or weren't uh, covered um, and are peculiar, peculiar to the site. Or there's not any uh, significant impacts that are substantially more severe because of new information. Um, but there's a, a special one for this where you have a if you have a significant impact that uh, might be special to the to the uh, site, but if it's mitigated through the application of some standard uh, features in your policies or ordinances called uniformly applied development policies or standards, uh, then uh, that uh, impact is not 
peculiar to the project and therefore you don't have to do more environmental review. So it gives you additional flexibility uh, to, um, you know, to address uh, that, uh, that condition. Uh, next slide, please. Here are examples of those uh, uniform, uh, uniformly applied uh, development policies or standards. These are from the guidelines, uh, but it gives you the this, this sense of we're either talking about uh, development standards or design standards like, like hillside development or grading ordinances uh, or um, standardized environmental uh, protection uh, or conservation features like habitat protection, view protection, or, or floodplain uh, ordinances. Um, the list, except for greenhouse gas, has been around for a long time. You know, greenhouse gas requirements, um, you know, reduction requirements for greenhouse gas that are uniformly applied were added in an amendment uh, later to the guideline. So that's another one that, that can be applied. So, so this is a very powerful, very uh, uh, available tool to, to use. Uh, next slide, we can uh, conclude with its advantages and disadvantages. Um, and I uh, would certainly encourage you to, to look uh, whenever you have a project application that comes in that's consistent with the density of your general plan, community plan, or, or zoning action. Um, and uh, you, you will be able to um, you know, use it broadly if that's the case. As I mentioned, no limitations on units, on project site size, or other other exceptions, and um, uh, and uh, a very uh, strong limitation on the issues to be addressed in additional environmental review. Those that are peculiar to the site or the project, uh, much like the approach with other opportunities where an EIR has been prepared, a checklist is a good way to go through this process to develop the, the evidence that shows that uh, all the impacts were, were covered in the general plan, community plan or zoning action EIR, nothing is peculiar to the site or project. Uh, you know, Take advantage of the Appendix G organization of impacts to, to do that and uh, modify the checklist to, to answer those questions. And then um, if there are uh, uniformly applied development policies or standards that mitigate the, the effects at hand, then be sure to describe what those are and how that mitigation occurs. So, uh, Margaret, I think you have a court decision to share about this as well. Right. And this is a 2006 case, Walmart Stores versus the city of Turlock. And it, it shows that, yes, 15183 has been on the books for a while. And I have been using this. Um, provision for quite some time. I I find it very useful, and you make a good point, Curtis, about maybe it needs a be updated a smidge um, in dealing with that density point. But nonetheless, in in this case, the court grappled with whether one five one eight three was a, the appropriate um, exemption. Um, for the project. So what was the project? City of Turlock, you can tell from the picture, um, enacted a zoning ordinance that while it permitted the operation of the traditional big boxes we used to think of them in a designated district, it prohibited the development anywhere in the city of what then became the discount superstores with the, with the grocery stores attached. Um, city found the ordinance was exempt under 15183 because its effects were adequately covered by the general plan EIR. So the court rejected Walmart's argument that the ordinance would lead to multi-tenant shopping centers. They said that was unsupported by anything in the administrative record. And the impacts of such shopping centers are not project specific environmental effects under 15183 peculiar to the ordinance or characteristic of only that ordinance. So in other words, you may see that effect, but it's not one that would disqualify you from using 15183. All of the other effects were taking, all of the effects were adequately covered in the general plan EIR and, and the court did sort of grapple with, as you can see, what's what's the terminology for peculiar? What's the definition? A physical change in the environment would be peculiar to the ordinance if that physical change belongs exclusively or especially to the ordinance or its characteristics of only the ordinance. 
Please also scribble a note on this slide that this case is disfavored on other grounds, not with respect to this interpretation of 15183, and that's the reason we cite it today, but for other reasons, um, not, not relevant to this conversation. You know, Margaret, the um, characteristic of only, uh, to me, is a very helpful phrase there for the word peculiar. And, and let me add just one other comment. Uh, before we move to the next uh, topic, and that is if you're looking to uh, find examples of jurisdictions that use this uh, tool extensively, um, the, the ones that I'm familiar with and, and that we've worked with include the County of San Diego, uh, the uh, County of Alameda, City of San Francisco, and the City of Sacramento. I'm sure there are others, but if you, if you search uh, you know, uh, 15183 exemption process and put the name of those jurisdictions in, you, then you'll come up with, with um, the forms they use, examples of documents and things of that nature that might be helpful. Okay. Thank you. All right. So in the next few slides here, we're, we're going to cover some of the streamlining provisions in uh, the legislation, SB 226, 375, and SB 743, which each had some, some different um, incentives to streamline CEQA uh, as part of that legislation. And some of these date back quite a ways already. So first we'll talk about streamlining for infill projects under SB 226, which is really adopted with the intent of promoting faster and simpler approval of infill projects that are consistent with a sustainable community strategy. So um, section 15183.3 of the guidelines was added, which is different from 15183 that Curtis just talked about. Um, and this allows for limited CEQA review for qualifying infill projects through a process that resembles tiering of, of EIRs. <clears throat> These provisions limit CEQA review to those effects that were either not addressed in a prior EIR for a general plan, community plan, specific plan, or zoning, or it limits them to effects associated with substantial new information where impacts will be more significant than in the prior EIR. So you're, you're starting to see a little a theme there regarding tiering and, and maybe turning to, uh, to 15162 to, uh, to document that. So these provisions apply really to um, a wide range of projects, not just housing, um, but residential is certainly included as one of the, the uses here. Now to be eligible, the site must be within an urban area that's been previously developed, or at least 75% of the perimeter adjoins existing qualified urban uses. And there are, also statewide standards outlined in Appendix M of the guidelines that must be met. Um, this one is, is um, kind of hidden in there and, and probably not widely known. And it includes design elements such as, you know, you're incorporating renewable energy into the project, you're remediating for soil and water issues, you're not sited um, within 500 feet of a high volume roadways or, or stationary sources that emit harmful emissions. Now, there are also standards based on the type of project. So, for instance, if you're a residential project <clears throat> to qualify, you must be within a low vehicle travel area and achieve below average regional VMT. You must be located within half a mile of a major transit stop or high quality transit corridor. And there must be a commitment to lower income affordability. And of course, the project needs to be consistent with a sustainable community strategy or alternative planning strategy. So while this does apply to a wide range of projects, it does require some level of documentation. And so you'll, you'll first need to complete a written checklist. Uh, CEQA guidelines provides Appendix N as a sample checklist that, that can be used. And you can see it's, it's essentially the Appendix G checklist that's been modified to help you determine um, whether the project would result in new significant impacts or whether it's been adequately analyzed in the prior EIR or possibly whether impacts are substantially mitigated by uniformly applied development policies and standards, which, which Curtis talked about. Um, so in the checklist, you would explain whether there are any effects that were analyzed in the prior EIR. You would incorporate any applicable mitigation measures, explain whether there are 
new effects that were not addressed, or maybe there are substantial new information that shows adverse effects are more significant. You would also want to document whether any of those uniformly applied development policies or standards would substantially mitigate significant effects. And if you can do all that, uh, you, may be, um, you may be able to get a no further review determination if the project results in no new significant effects or more significant effects, or if those UADPs substantially mitigate those effects. So um, otherwise you would prepare a NEGDAC, a mitigated NEGDAC, or what's called an infill EIR. Um, either way though, the, the additional streamlining benefits are that the analysis is not required to address uh, growth inducing impacts and analysis of alternatives does not need to address alternative locations, densities, or building intensities. So this, um, this flow chart is from our guidance materials, just shows the process we just discussed from conducting the preliminary review of the performance standards, <clears throat> completion of the environmental checklist, and the determination of the type of environmental review that may be required, along with the appropriate steps to take. So this is available on SCAG's website, which um, we'll show you some of those guidance materials later on here. Okay, time for another poll. We'd like to know, whether um, your agency um, has a certified EIR on a general plan, community plan, or zoning that may be used for streamlining, and whether or not you've found it to be useful to streamline CEQA documents for housing projects. So we'll give you say, 15 seconds on this one. All right, let's see. Okay, um, half of you, half of you who answered have no idea, <laughs> but we'll take a look at it. Good, well, hopefully that's helpful. And a few of you um, have found it helpful. Some have found it not helpful. Again, we'd like to uh, maybe have you answer in, in the Q&A um, what has not been helpful for you. So maybe we can help you out there in using it for the future. Okay, let's see, next. So we'll talk about um, streamlining for transit-oriented projects, which are covered under both SB 375 and SB 743, which have a, a little bit different um, criteria. So we'll talk about some of those. Now, SB 375 goes back to 2008. So again, this has been, this has been around for a while. And the, the primary objective of SB 375 was really to achieve greenhouse gas reductions um, consistent with AB 32 through regional transportation planning, but it did offer CEQA incentives to projects that are consistent with a sustainable community strategy. Now in the last workshop, we talked about the sustainable communities project exemption that was added for transit priority projects, but for, for TPPs that do not fit that exemption, there are other options for streamlining using a sustainable communities environmental assessment. Um, often called a SCIA or limited EIR, and there's also some other reduced level of analysis that um, that you can gain from from these provisions here. Uh, first, um, in the context of SB 375, we want to provide a little background on SCAG's sustainable community strategy here. So SCAG's SCS is combined with the Regional Transportation Plan, which provides a vision for Southern California's future as well as policy strategies and specific projects for advancing the region's mobility, economy, and sustainability for at least the next 20 years. It does integrate um, a regional development pattern and transportation network and identify strategies that help to achieve those greenhouse gas reductions um, targets pursuant to SB 375. Now the, the current RTP SES also called Connect SoCal 2020, um, that was adopted in September 2020, and the plan does need to be updated every four years per federal requirement. So SCAG is currently in the process of updating um, Connect SoCal 2024, which is uh, underway. So for more information, you can visit SCAG's website here, um, which we can put in the chat for you if you want to take a look at that and see where we're at. 
So to be eligible for streamlining under any of the SB 375 provisions, the project must first meet the definition of a transit priority project um, as defined in Public Resources Code 21155. Now this includes projects with no more than 200 units on less than eight acres within a half a mile from a rail stop or a quarter mile from a high quality transit corridor. And at least 50% of the project must be residential with minimum net density of 20 dwelling units per acre. And if the remaining portion of the project, maybe it's a mixed use project, is non-residential, there are floor area requirements, floor area ratio requirements that must be met at at, at least um, 0.75. And um, as we've talked, the project needs to be um, consistent with, uh, with the SES or the alternative planning strategy. Um, so as I mentioned in the last workshop, in order to qualify for the exemption, there's a rather lengthy list of land use and environmental criteria, as well as other community benefits that must be met. And for those that don't meet the exemption, um, section of the Public Resources Code 21155.2 outlines the process for streamlining CEQA using either the, the SCIA or the limited EIR. So this flow chart is also provided in our guidance uh, materials on the website and provides a summary of the process and the requirements. We'll talk a little bit about each one of these in the moment, but um, in each case, the statute indicates that the analysis is built on prior EIRs, but it does not um, specify. It doesn't specify whether it could be a general plan EIR, it could be a specific, specific plan EIR, it could be the original transportation plan or the SCS EIR. So you as the lead agency, um, it's really up to your discretion to identify which one covers the site and its development the best. And the project must, um, once you've made that determination, the project must incorporate any mitigation measures, uh, performance standards or other criteria from the original EIR. So the SCIA is really like an MND uh, with superpowers for projects that result in less than significant impacts. It really relies on <clears throat> preparation of initial study to identify whether there are potentially significant impacts or impacts that may be mitigated through incorporation of mitigation measures, uh, from the prior EIR or whether there might be new mitigation measures that may be needed as part of the project specific analysis. Now the initial study needs to identify also whether there are cumulative effects that were addressed and mitigated in the prior EIR and where a determination that impacts been adequately mitigated, you may find that those impacts are not cumulatively considerable. So as far as the process, you would want to circulate the initial study for a 30-day public review, just like an MND. Consider any comments received, but there are no um, there are no requirements to respond to comments like there are in, a, in an EIR, but some lead agencies prefer to do that as a matter of practice. And I, I think Margaret would probably agree that um, it's, it's recommended that you address all those comments. Um, you would conduct your public hearing, make findings, just like a, a regular MND and, and adopt your SCEA. And I just want to point out here that um, if you're interested in using these provisions, City of Los Angeles has a great library here of SCIAs that you might want to take a look at, for examples, um, at their website here. Okay, in the SCIA process, you may also admit the analysis of certain impacts that are identified in um, Public Resources Code Section 21159.28. And these include growth inducing effects as well as project and cumulative impacts from cars and light duty trucks on global warming or the regional transportation network. Now, one of the biggest superpowers of streamlining benefits to the SCIA is that it's not subject to a fair argument challenge, but rather uses the substantial evidence standard of review, which is equivalent to the protections offered by a, a full EIR. And I think as, as most of us probably are aware, um, the biggest threat of a fair argument uh, for an MND is probably the number one vulnerability. And it's, it's a fairly low bar for any opponent to use to challenge a project. And with a, with a SCIA, this can save the applicant and agency substantial amounts of time and costs, possibly. Yeah, Chad, I think it just continues to be a, a shout out to SCAG and the other MPOs. 
you know, if, if you're at a, working in a local agency, open up that sustainable community strategy and mm -hmm. see if you can either use the exemption or the skia. I think skia is sort of forgotten oftentimes and underused. But as you said, you know, love the substantial evidence standard, which um, brings us, if you're ready for it, to the Sacramento case. And, yes. and in this case, without going into a lot of detail, the city had determined they had a project that, at issue that fit, that was a transit priority project, as Chad described, and they used a skia because there was consistent land use designations, density, and intensity. And the Metropolitan Planning Agency for Sacramento, SACOG, um, in course of the litigation, when it was the use of the skia was challenged, also um, submitted a very helpful amicus brief that explained the process outlining how member cities could determine if a project was consistent with SB 375. It showed how they had mapped the transit networks to create community types. And that way, the city of Sacramento was able to determine that this project was located within what was called a center and corridor community, which was one to, that typically was had you know high density and more um, mixed use than the surrounding areas. So the the challenge here on the skia was, can you use it? Court said yes, but what is the legal standard of review? So this is where we really got the legal blessing that it's a substantial evidence test, and I think based upon that, we all rallied a bit more around the skia. And then we have one other case that I wanted to bring your, to your attention, Old East Davis Neighborhood Association versus the City of Davis, a more recent case. And in this case, the project was, it's called the Trackside Project for those of you that know Davis. It was a basically 50,000 square foot mixed use building. It had ground floors, you'd think retail, typical 27 apartment units. Um, on half an acre, and it sits within what was a transition area between down the downtown core of Davis and Old East Davis residential unit. So city uses a skia, and they want to show general plan consistency, which was a requirement. So the main point of um, contention here was whether substantial evidence supported the city's finding um, that it, there was consistency because of the policies that said the trans track side must serve as a transition. So the general plan had several transition oriented policies. Um, new buildings must maintain scaled transition, have architectural fit and fall within the existing scale for new development, um, et cetera, et cetera. The court agreed that the city had determined that it was consistent with the general plan and that their determination in looking at their own general plan policies, we give them deference, um, was not unreasonable and there was substantial evidence to support it. Then the association made a second argument that I thought was a little bit pathetic myself, but they tried to say that as a skia, you also have to meet the qualifications in 21155.1. And remember, those are the qualifications for an exemption. And the court said, no, no, no. We're, we're on a different part of that flow chart that Chad showed you. We're in the point two, we're in the skia world, not the exemption. And they don't have to go back through and show, for example, that the project did not have a significant effect on historical resources. Um, so they, they clarified that here again. I think that second argument was a weak argument. That's all on that one. Thank you, Margaret. Okay. So <clears throat> onto the limited EIR. So when there are significant impacts through um, for a transit priority project that can't be mitigated through incorporation of prior mitigation measures or new mitigation measures, um, then we want to uh, move on to preparation of a limited EIR. Now this, this process um, is similar. It, it entails preparation of an initial study to identify all significant or potentially significant impacts. 
And the initial study also needs to identify whether there are cumulative effects that were adequately addressed and mitigated in the prior EIR, and uh, where a determination that the impact's been adequately mitigated, you may find that impacts are not cumulatively considerable as part of your, your limited EIR. Now, the, limit, the EIR really only needs to address the potentially significant impacts um, that you've identified in that initial study. So it can really be highly focused on, on kind of the, the particular issues in regards to your project. And similar to the SCIA, the EIR may also omit discussion of growth inducing effects as well as project and cumulative effects from cars and light trucks on global warming or the regional transportation network. And with this one, with the EIR, the limited EIR, you're also not required to analyze offsite alternatives. So you, you have a few additional benefits there as compared to um, your typical EIR process. And then um, finally, under SB 375, for, for residential and mixed use projects that do not meet the definition of a transit priority projects, but they are consistent with a sustainable community strategy or, or alternative planning strategy, um, you may you may be subject to um, or you may be able to reduce your your review. Now you would follow the standard CEQA process, but again you're not required to address growth inducing impacts, project specific or cumulative impacts from cars and light duty trips on global warming or the regional transportation network, or um, address a reduced density alternative. But I I would recommend that you incorporate by reference the analysis from the sustainable community strategy EIR. Um, to help you make that determination. Okay, so on to SB 743. So SB 743 was adopted for really um, the purposes of fostering land use changes that would encourage less driving. So think about mixed use and transit oriented infill types of projects. Uh, this too established sequence streamlining incentives for projects that are consistent with the sustainable community strategy by adding sections to the guidelines and the public resources code for, for transit oriented development that's consistent with and implements a specific plan for which an EIR has been certified. Now, additionally, SB 743 established that aesthetic and parking impacts are not considered significant for qualifying projects, except for maybe where you have um, aesthetic impacts on historic resources. So this, um, this is really kind of classified as an exemption, if you can demonstrate consistency with the specific plan. But we wanted to mention it here because it does require some documentation that tears from, from a prior EIR. So in, in order to qualify under this provision, the project must be a residential mixed use or employment center. It must be an infill site within a transit priority area located within half a mile of transit. And like some of the other exemptions, the project must be consistent with a sustainable community strategy. If there are substantial changes or significant new impacts relative to that specific plan EIR, then the project is not eligible for this exemption. So you'll, you'll need to consider the triggers for supplemental and subsequent environmental documents based on any changes to, to that specific plan and that, that EIR since its adoption. So some of the advantages of, of this provision, a variety of uses are eligible. So it's not just necessarily housing. There are no limits on the number of units, building floor area or the size of the projects and um, no stated environmental restrictions. But as far as your approach, you wanna demonstrate consistency with the SCS or APS. You want to document your changes to the specific plan CEQA document. We suggest like some of the others using a, a modified environmental checklist um, similar to what you'd use for an addendum or a 15183 consistency determination and go through the potential triggers as to whether the project would result in new or substantially more significant effects and, and clearly explain your rationale. Uh, but uh, one of the benefits here is you may omit, as I mentioned, the aesthetic and parking impacts or just conclude that impacts are less than significant. Now, Public Resources Code Section 21081.3 states that a lead agency is not required to evaluate aesthetic effects of a project, and aesthetic effects shall not be con considered significant if the project involves uh, the refurbish refurbishment, 
conversion, repurposing, or replacement of an existing building that meets all of the following five requirements. The building, if the building is abandoned, dilapidated, or has been vacant for more than a year. The building sites immediately adjacent to parcels that are developed with qualified urban uses, or at least 75% of the perimeter adjoins parcels that are developed with urban uses. The project includes the construction of housing. Any new structure does not substantially exceed the height of the existing structure. And the project does not create new source of substantial light or glare. However, there are, there are a few exceptions. So um, this does not apply to projects with potentially significant effects on an official state scenic highway or projects with significant aesthetic effects on historic or cultural resources. So if you attempt to use this, make sure that you conduct any necessary historic building surveys and evaluations as part of that. Okay, time for a poll. In this poll, we'd like to know whether your jurisdiction contains any transit areas that may benefit for streamlining under SB 375 and, and or SB 743. And if so, have you found these useful to streamline under CEQA? Give you 15 seconds or so here. Okay, let's see. Okay, a few of you are regularly using these. Maybe you can tell us in the uh, Q and A which agencies you are, if you if you're so bold. <laughs> Maybe we can uh, have some of the other agencies learn from you here. Um, it's equally split here, though. Some of these streamlining have have not been helpful. Again, we'd like to hear from you on that if we could. Um, and then some of you do not have qualifying transit opportunities. Okay. So um, before we wrap up here, I'd like to just share some of these resources really quickly that we developed for SCAG as part of the program. And these include um, CEQA guide guidance, but also administrative planning guidance, such as density bonus laws, SB 9 and 10, SB 330 and SB 35. Um, and each of these kind of provide some short background practice tips, as well as some helpful worksheets that um, might help you determine the applicability of various streamlining options, uh, and also provide the documentation that may help you support the analysis under these provisions. So again, these are um, available on the website here. We just pull over a couple of these to show you. First one I wanna show you is a, a matrix that kind of provides um, a comparison of the different streamlining provisions, how you might qualify, what the streamlining benefits are. There are some links in here as well that um, can help you provide, help identify some additional resources or guide you to this particular sections of the guidelines here. Um, Next, I want to show you real quickly, we have a whole um, a whole bulletin here on SB 375, which goes through first the exemptions, um, as well as, are you guys able to see my screen, by the way? Okay. <laughs> it talks about the different criteria for the exemption, and then you'll see some of the things we talked about today. Um, there are different streamlining reviews with the, the SCIA, the limited EIRs, and um, some of the other benefits here. So this uh, hopefully will help you. We have some worksheets in here as well. So it'll take you through each of the provisions in the public resources code and the guidelines. Um, you can go through and, and um, use this to help identify whether you're eligible or maybe where you might need to make some changes to the project in order to be eligible um, for streamlining under each of these. We also have one that talks about um, streamlining for projects consistent with the community plan, which is one that Curtis talked about. So again, you'll you'll find some helpful information here. What does it mean to be peculiar? We have a little bit on that, which we talked about. Um, there are some information on what is it, what are uniformly applied development standards, the process we talked about, we showed you some of that. And <clears throat> finally, um, Sorry if I'm making you dizzy here. Some worksheets at the back, again, that will help you determine if you're, you're eligible here. So lots of good guidance and resources available on SCAG's website. And I think 
we just have a final poll and we're, we're hoping that this has really expanded some of the possibilities to streamline our views. So um, want to gauge whether you'd be more likely to use some of these in the future or um, certainly reach out if you would like some additional guidance um, and stay tuned for some of the office hours that, uh, that we'll be holding. And Chad, as people are responding to the poll, did you see there are two questions in the q and I have not yet. Let's see. Okay, the first one. In practice, we still require several technical reports for streamlining and tiering. Is that what you generally see and or recommend, or is there something we can do to avoid requiring all the technical reports for future projects? I, I'm happy to let some others um, help with this, but I, I certainly think that you know, as we've talked about throughout this workshop, it's really you need to really provide some substantial evidence for many of these. Um, not only for the exemptions, but throughout the tiering um, and to be able to consider whether you're consistent with the prior EIR and go through that environmental checklist. I think it's a good idea to provide some additional technical analysis. That may be a full study. It may be just some analysis in your checklist, but um, I think you definitely, there's definitely, it's warranted in certain situations. Margaret or Tyson? Yeah, I, I think it really depends upon the nature of the exemptions and the nature of the findings and how obvious they are on its face. So it's a little, I think, difficult to answer that in in general. Yeah, I think. Um, be, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. As I say, if you're using sort of that revised initial study approach, you may be able to cull it down to seeing where you really need to the technical studies for substantial evidence. So unfortunately, I agree with with Tyson and Chad. It's not it's not a yes no. You're going to have to look at each each situation and each resource area. Yeah, and uh, I I agree with what you're saying, Margaret, about using the initial study or whatever checklist and instrument to try to narrow it. <clears throat> we found that if you if you approach it trying to determine if an explanation that relates analysis back to the EIR that uh, is supporting your your decision that's already been prepared, <clears throat> then uh, many times you can have have good explanation and cross references to avoid new technical analysis and and you know thinking about it in that context first and then and then by exception, if you can't handle it that way, then yes, a technical study may indeed be be needed for that substantial evidence. Excellent. Okay, next question. Have you seen Coastal Act standards or requirement used as uh, uniformly applied development policies and standards? I, I can take a first shot at that um, if you'd like. Um, again, it's, you know, the answer is it depends, I think, on the circumstances. But uh, if you look at uh, 15183 in subpart F, there's a, there's a thick paragraph there that describes um, you know, how something becomes a uniformly uh, applied development uh, policy or standard. And uh, one of the requirements is that uh, it's previously adopted by a city or county, you know, with a finding that the, the uh, uh, policies or standards would mitigate the, the impacts. And so in the coastal zone, if you're dealing uh, with a location where there is a, an approved local coastal uh, program, and that uh, has been uh, approved using an EIR, uh, then I think that you have a very strong argument that the LCP would qualify in the definition of a, a community plan if it has uh, development policies and implementation measures, two of the requirements. Uh, and I think most LCPs that I'm aware of uh, in, in urban areas have that. So uh, if you've got that, that previously adopted, uh, uniformly applied um, development, policy in the LCP, then then you could, I think, use that. If you don't have that, I think it's more of a struggle, uh, may not be applicable. Um, I'd like to add on to what Curtis just said. Um, under that same paragraph 15183, uh, subsection F, um, it does also state that a policy or standard need not be part of the general plan or community plan, but can be included in a zoning ordinance or other enactments. And I'd also point out that 
the local coastal program is statutorily defined as being the coastal land use plan and the zoning ordinance and those are statutorily also defined as being the uh, public agency's general plan and zoning ordinance under the government code. So um, assuming that when you refer to coastal act standards, you're referring to the LCP, I, I think those are essentially the same as your general plan or in zoning enactments. Right. And, and the examples that are given in subsection G mm -hmm. specifically say are not limited to. So it looks like you can sketch a path forward um, if you can connect the dots in the Okay. And not a question, but a comment. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. We appreciate the kudos. <laughs> nice to see that. Uh, let's see. And have you seen any communities streamline CEQA? I mean, I think we're, we're seeing a lot more of these come up lately, especially using the 15183 section to, um, as a consistency with the general plan, we've been involved in preparing consistency determinations and memos for a few different clients. I think we use um, we use quite a bit of the exemptions too that we talked about in the previous workshop. So certainly a lot more use, but I think I think there's certainly a lot more um, a lot of agencies that can take advantage of these that are not and hopefully this is going to be helpful. And I think over the last several years we've also seen a lot of uh, specific plan exemption um, being utilized as well as a lot of case law surrounding the application of specific plan exemptions there were i think four or five published decisions on those for the last five years well and again i put in a plug to using skags scs you know a lot of blood sweat and tears go into producing those documents every four years and they're great planning documents so you know, along with their eir so the extent we can use them let's let's go for it that was not a paid advertisement. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, okay, we have a, let's see, clarification. Have we seen CEQA streamlining for rezoning and zoning amendments? Anybody? I think you might see it to the extent that um, the zoning amendments were contemplated in, say, a, a general plan housing elements review. Um, I'm trying to think of another situation where you would have the benefit of previously analyzed zoning amendments. I think that's the primary scenario. Yeah, that's the one I've thought of. And in fact, I, you know, you may do an EIR that covers your housing element and the implementation plan. Um, but the same logic should carry over to other zoning amendments as long as you can show they're covered in the first tier document. Yeah, I mean, I. I I think a general, if you're doing a, an EIR for a general plan and your zoning amendment is consistent with that, oftentimes the zoning occurs after the general plan to implement that. And I, I think if you can document that it's consistent and the impacts are covered, that would be one way to use that. Okay, I think that's the end of our questions here in the Q&A. Um, if there's nothing else, we'd like to Certainly, thank you for joining. Um, stay tuned and check back to SCAG's website for additional updates. Um, we'll be having registration coming up for the office hours at some point very soon. And um, if you'd like to download a copy of this presentation or view it later, it'll also be on the website there. Nasha, did you have any final closing remarks? No? No, thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay, have a great day. Thank you. Bye.